we do have the Montpelier Charter, and um, I see Andrea just um, invited um, Representative Hooper to join us. So, and I know John Odom's already here. So, if you don't mind, I think it would be good to get their testimony um, if everybody's okay with that. Um, seeing thumbs up and nods. Okay, great. Thank you. John, since you are here, do you want to start testifying and, and then we'll let Representative Hooper? Uh, absolutely. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. And it's always a pleasure and an honor to speak before this committee. Uh, nice to see most of you all again. Um, I, I will try to be very brief um, since I know you all have the, you know, I, I did speak to this committee uh, fairly extensively last time around, and I know that information was then reflected in the bill that went to the, the floor, which was, was, was passed um, uh, pretty strongly. Um, I know we had uh, Tacoma Park City Clerk, uh, Jesse Carpenter speak before you all, um, as well as uh, Peter Teachout speaking to the constitutionality, which was you know, then followed by the extraordinarily you know, thorough report uh, from the legislative council, which was terrific. We also had Dan Richardson speak to you, who's one of our city councilors, and who was key in drafting the, the, uh, the, the charter change proposal. Um, I'll just blast through, I guess, the, the sense of the community, and this did pass by about 66, 67% uh, in Montpelier. Um, I guess our, our thinking was, first off, the idea that you can be a citizen of the city without being a citizen of the state. I mean, the citizen in the, in the general sense, who we consider a member of the community who can participate. For example, I am a citizen of Vermont, but I'm not a citizen of Montana. So that doesn't necessarily mean that the being that, that citizenship is completely one-to-one -one linear stuck together. And that's what we're talking about, who are, who are essentially citizens of our community. The Montpelier proposal was not about the state or any other town. This was not an attempt to make a statement about state policy. It was just Montpelier citizens deciding how they want to decide their, their own affairs, basically. These are our neighbors. They pay property taxes. They have kids in the schools. We had a, a couple of folks testifying who were examples of that. They participate in community life, but they are not allowed to vote on who represents them on the city council or what the budget should be. And the Montpelier citizenry is clearly made the statement that they think that's unfair. Um, now, a lot of the common arguments you hear that is that it's, um, well, I already covered that it, the, the question of, of constitutionality. I think that's been pretty well covered. It's worth saying, repeating again, that we wouldn't be the first. Non-citizen voting has been happening in several municipalities in Maryland, in Tacoma Park, for literally for a generation. And it hasn't been an issue. but. In San Francisco and Chicago, you have opportunities for non-citizen parents with kids in school to participate in school board elections. You know, Hyattsville, Maryland, Mount Rainier, Maryland, Chevy Chase, Maryland, a few more towns have been doing this. Um, in other nations, to the extent that, that you all are interested, there's, there's a huge list of, of nations that, are, that allow non-citizens, but who are, who are essentially citizens of the community, members of the community, uh, to vote on municipal issues, sometimes more issues than that. And that's Canada, Switzerland, New Zealand, Ireland, Argentina, Belgium, and the list goes on and on. Um, Non-citizen voting was the norm in the early days of the US, which means the founding fathers and all their children voted in elections alongside non-citizens. Um, Non-citizen voting rights in most states were scuttled by constitutional amendments and or statutes mostly between 1880, but as recently as 1926, which is a period when literacy tests, poll taxes, uh, restrictive residency and voter registration requirements were introduced generally in response to nativism movements at the time. Um, Non-citizen voting would, the ballots would specifically be designed for them. So it would include, uh, or would not include national, state, school, uh, or other municipalities such as the Central Vermont Public Safety Authority, which is chartered as a municipality. There would be two separate checklists maintained by the clerk so that um, that can be distinct from any questions about it mixing in to the uh, um, uh, Secretary of State's you know, the federally mandated overall voter checklist that is kept. Um, undocumented 
immigrants will not be at risk at having their information revealed because this only applies to legal residents. Uh, the voter registration and the issue that, that came up just briefly um, about how you verify and why would just be the oath. First of all, I would say the oath would still apply since Montpelier is a creation of the state swearing to vote in a way most conducive to the best good of Vermont still applies. Um, but the concern about additional ID requirements is that creating higher bars for non-citizen registration is a slippery slope. It opens up the sauce for the goose, sauce for the gander argument, which could allow you then to start raising that bar for other citizens. It could create a, 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 a sort of justification for that. And again, I think what we have has in Vermont has worked quite fine. And we're talking literally about sharing that at the local level. Um, TIP districts, bonds, council priorities, those are all decisions representing the overall will of the community itself, not any individual voter or set of voters. And again, Montpelier has the right to, or should have the right to decide who it considers members of its own community. And we've spoken pretty clearly and decisively on that topic as a, as a you know, on the ballot. I don't know if you all have any more questions, but that's sort of the quick review of what uh, what I discussed uh, with y'all last time around. Well, thank you, John. And, and before we go to questions, um, I'd like to give Representative Hooper an opportunity to testify. I know she's very busy. Um, so um, Representative Hooper. So thank you. And thank you very much committee for uh, taking up our charter amendment. Um, frankly, I did not prepare any testimony for you, um, and I'm sorry I missed the beginning of um, Montpelier's most able city clerk, um, and I, I totally agree with what he presented, I, what I heard. Um, one, the, the last biennium when this committee considered this proposal, um, your former legislative council did some really interesting research in terms of, of what, how, th how this issue had been treated in the past. And my recollection from one of those pieces was a dissertation on, um, perhaps it was a legal dissertation on the value of allowing non-citizens to vote on municipal uh, to vote um, as a way of uh, introducing them to the political process and engaging them in community and making them part of who we are. And this was something that was written in the um, 1800s is my recollection, but never trust my memory. Um, but I just thought that was terribly com compelling in terms of how we create community. And I know that in the city of Montpelier, we have many long, not, not many, we have a number of long-term, deeply engaged residents who do not have access to engaging in our community in that way. They contribute a huge amount to our civic discourse and our and our into who we are as a community. And asking them into this process through through the voting process, I think, is just one more way of building a really strong community, which is what we're all interested in, but in this instance, Montpelier's just asking to be allowed to engage her own citizens in a way that makes sense to themselves. And so we would deeply appreciate, the city of Montpelier would deeply appreciate if you would support the vote that we have taken in the past. And I would note what was supported by this committee in the last biennium, as well as by the house in the last biennium. Um, we think it is a way to build stronger, more vibrant um, communities by engaging all of our residents, not just a few or few. Of, anyway, you understand what I mean. Thank you. Thank you, Representative Hooper. Questions from the committee? Mark, 
Go right ahead. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, this isn't necessarily a question, but a few things that have come up uh, that other folks have talked about. Uh, when you talked about property taxpayers, John, in particular, um, there's been a discussion around uh, uh, maybe second homeowners or people that own property outside of the town that are property taxpayers as well. Uh, they, they don't necessarily have a vote. Um, I guess there's a fairness issue in a sense. Uh, I have and know of uh, other Canadian residents living here in my district who are very outspoken. They certainly let me know what's on their mind. Um, they are not uh, able to um, be involved in, in voting. So uh, there's, there's still a few issues out there that, uh, that concern me. Thank you. John, do you want to respond to that? Sure. Um, I, I've definitely heard that concern before. I think um, that is a very distinct statement of legislative policy. Um, um, I, I think connecting the two is, is difficult. Um, they only connect in the most general sense, I think, of how conceptually voting is done in the state. Uh, for example, 18-year-old to vote. Um, you know, that, that sort of thing. I, I, I think there, I don't think there is a one-to-one -one policy connection at all. And I think if, if that were to come up in the future, and I know it's discussed a lot, I think it would have to be discussed on, on very much its own terms. Uh, you know, certainly, you know, the work that legislative council and others have done on this does not speak to that and does not really apply to that. And I would argue would not be relevant to that. I think that would be really a specific policy question that stands along. Thank you, John. Representative Hooper. Yeah, thank you. Rep Higley referenced the tax issue that people being represented, you know, having a voice in taxation. And I, I do not make the argument, and I don't think our community has made the argument that this is about representation um, for taxation purposes. This is an issue of how do we engage people in our community, not how do we give them a, a voice around taxes. So I agree with our city clerk that these are two separate and distinct issues um, in, in caution against putting the two together. And the first, the, what we're advocating for is um, essentially a community building tool, a way of welcoming people in and giving them a voice, not in tax policy, but in all of the policies that we are involved in. Um, in, in so we see it more narrowly. Thank you. And I believe the, the, the original draft of the Vermont Constitution had a very similar concept um, contained in it. Um, so, I mean, this is something that's been long part of the history of Vermont. Um, any other questions from committee? Okay, um, I realize this is listed as markup and vote, but um, I know I note that the, the memos that, that Tucker Anderson has talked about that deal with the constitutionality of this issue are, are not posted on our site. Um, Tucker, can we get those posted? Yeah, I'll take a look for them right now and send them along to Andrea. And are you available this afternoon at all? Or I certainly can be. I okay. think Andrea has access to my calendar. Okay. <laughs> Thank you, Tucker. And thanks, everyone. I think we're done for the morning.